Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today for this uh, very important activity uh, training session on the lining of on the improving the performance of canals with uh, geosynthetics. We have a wonderful list of uh, of panelists today. Uh, the, the, so we're going to start the presentation very soon. If my slide want to go. Uh, so, as you can see, we will have an, uh, an address first by Chung-Sik Yu, the president of the IGS, followed by Dr. Ragab Ragab, president of the ICID, and then His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Abdel Ati will introduce an overview of the national project for the rehabilitation and lining of canals in Egypt. So, first, uh, I would like to call Chung-Sik Yu, the president of the IGS, to make a quick introduction of the IGS. Are you available, uh, Cheng Sik? Yes, Eric. Thank you, Eric, for your uh, uh, nice introduction. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Abdel uh, Minister of Water Resources and Irrigation of Egypt, Professor Ragab Ragab, uh, President of ICID, and ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of the International Geosynthetic Society, I am pleased to welcome everyone from around the world to this event hosted by the IGS Technical Committee on Hydraulics. And this event with a the theme, improving the performance of canals with geosynthetics is quite relevant in these days as the water management has become an important issue around the world due to water shortages caused by climate change. I congratulate the chair of uh, TC Hydraulics, Eric and your team for successfully hosting this workshop. And I, I also, I'm very glad to see the continued collaboration between the IGS and ICID, which will make the relationship between the two organizations even stronger in the coming days. For those participants who are not familiar to the IGS, I prepared a couple of slides to share. So let me bring up uh, those uh, slides. Okay. Okay, can you see my slide screen? Yes. Okay. The uh, IGS was founded in 1983 as a learned society dedicated to the scientific and engineering development of just textiles, geomembranes, related products, and associated technologies. The core purpose of the IGS is to provide an understanding of and promote appropriate use of geosynthetics technology throughout the world. You are seeing the global map of IGS. Uh, the dark blue region, uh, dark blue colored region is where we have chapters. Here is IGS Egypt. And we have approximately 47 chapters with 4,000 individual and student members combined. We also have a strong relationship with industry, having approximately 190 uh, corporate members. The IGS is growing these days. So as you can see here, uh, Nord we have Nordic chapters, which has been established recently. And we have several other chapters uh, are in formation, for example, in Slovenia, Iceland, and Guatemala, and Bolivia. And this slide shows the membership demographic distributions for individual and corporate members by region. As you can see, Europe and Asia take up more than 75% of membership. And we also hope that we can have more members from Pan American and also African regions in the near future. As you can see in the slide, nowadays applications of geosynthetics indeed cover almost all areas of construction. For example, uh, various types of geosynthetics are used for railways, bridge and road construction, and also in walls and slope uh, construction, and also for coastal protection. They are also used in landfill, canal, 
the dam and tunnel and mining areas. So we can therefore say that geosynthetics have become regular civil engineering materials for infrastructure development. But as global warming threatens our built environment, the term sustainability has become a keyword in our daily life. Now, despite the increased popularity of the term sustainability, the possibility that human societies will achieve environmental sustainability has been and continues to be questioned in light of environmental degradation, climate change, overconsumption, population growth, and society's pursuit of unlimited economic growth in a closed system. Believe it or not, approximately 36% of global energy-related emissions come from buildings and related construction activities. Sustainable solutions are therefore needed to deliver infrastructures that support a desired quality of life for current and future generations while conserving resources and energy. The engineering response to this challenge relies significantly on innovative materials, new design and construction technologies. Geosynthetics have proven to be fundamental to sustainable infrastructure development. This is because a geosynthetic adaptive system allows us to reduce the carbon footprint over a conventional system by minimizing the use of natural resources. For example, it is known that one truck loaded with GCLs is equivalent to 150 trucks of clay needed for landfill construction, as you can see in this slide. So by adapting to synthetics, you can lower the cost of construction and reduce the carbon footprint. I believe that a further development in geosynthetics will bring more sustainable solutions to infrastructure development. The IGS is now making every effort to become a global leader in bringing sustainability in construction industry. As technologies and their spin-offs evolve quickly, the knowledge sharing has become more and more important and urgent for technology development. I am sure that this workshop will provide an open forum for more focused discussions on new ideas and innovative approaches for improving the performance of canals with geosynthetics. I again congratulate and thank TC Hydraulics and those who have put significant time and efforts to make this event possible. I also hope all the participants will enjoy the three-day workshop program, which will be which will full of great lectures and presentations. Now, due to the pandemic, although we cannot be physically together, but we are together. That's what it counts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yu. So now, uh, without further waiting, I would like to ask Dr. Ragab to make a short introduction of the ICID. So, Dr. Ragab is a president of the International Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, the ICID. He's a fellow principal hydrologist and water resource management specialist at UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology, UK long experience of being employed by both university and research centers. Vice president between 2010 and 2013 of the International Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, the chairman of the Permanent Committee on Strategy and Organization, PCSO of ICID, Chairman of the Working Group on Water Food Energy Nexus, ICID, and was the Chairman of the British National Committee on Irrigation and Drainage, ICID UK. He's a founder of the Work Group on the Use of Non-Conventional Water Resource for Food Production. He's the International Advisor to a number of national and international organizations, lecturer, superior, and external examiner, examiner of, uh, to various universities and in and outside the UK. He's a recipient of several national and international awards, reviewers for more than 20 international journals and evaluators for several funding organizations, author and co-author of numerous scientific papers and editor and co-editor of several special issues on international journals, as well as conference proceedings. 
member of the editorial board of four scientific journals, including the Cambridge University Journal of Agriculture Science. So Dr. Ragab, if you can yeah. give us. Yeah, thank you very much for a uh, very generous introduction, uh, uh, Engineer Eric. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, uh, Dr. Abdelati, the Minister of Water, Resources and Delegation in Egypt, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I would like also to, to thank the IGS uh, President, Professor Yu, and uh, Eric, especially for taking the initiative to, to get this joint uh, uh, webinar between ICID and IGS. I will just have here a few slides, um, if I may. I'll just uh, say a few words about the, the ICID. Uh, for those they, they are not really familiar with the organization. Uh, the ICID actually is an international uh, organization uh, and it is really technical, not for profit. It has been established in 1950 following the, the Second World War uh, and it has been really in the forefront of the Green Revolution. Uh, it has uh, so many activities, and uh, although the focus on irrigation and drainage, but actually it is extending its activity to cover climate change, the, the water food energy nexus, and also extreme events like drought and flood. Uh, the, the ICID has a, a mission, and it's, it, it, its mission really is to work together towards sustainable agricultural water management and through interdisciplinary approaches to economically viable, uh, socially acceptable and environmentally sound irrigation drainage and flood management. And it's a vision of the, uh, for the uh, 2030 is really to have a water secure world free of poverty and hunger. And for, for that, actually, uh, the, the ICID has got some six organi organizational uh, goals uh, to, uh, to achieve its vision. And this is really goes from to enable higher crop productivity with less water and energy, be a catalyst for change in policies and practices, and facilitate change of information and knowledge, and also enable cross-disciplinary and intersectoral engagement and encourage research and support development tools. The, some of the ICID actually achievements is that it, it, it is now really having uh, 120 members. Country, it covers 90% of the irrigated area of the world. It, it has 18 wide areas of technical activities that the, 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 the are permanent committees, working groups, task forces and they cover climate change and water food energy nexus. And they, they, uh, they also established a awarding system to acknowledge uh, the individual achievements. They also established a well-known peer review journal, the Irrigation and Drain Journal that's published by uh, John Wiley and Sons in the USA and established regional groups per each continent and also established uh, an excellent dissemination network and knowledge uh, sharing through the webinars, through the um, website and online. The ICID membership is basically based on uh, one country, one vote, and it is based on national committees. Uh, for each country, they have a national committee. However, uh, currently the ICID also accepts a direct membership from companies uh, and institutions and individuals. Uh, because the agricultural water management really uh, it is in the heart of ICID and water use efficiency also very important and really um, in the agricultural water management, we pay quite uh, a good attention to that issue. And when it comes really to efficiency of irrigation uh, system, we look at how the irrigation actually uh, drops from the reservoirs all the way to the field. And you can see here from the reservoirs because evaporation is, uh, is, is really from a large area of those reservoirs uh, can take place a lot easier. 
And for that reason, you must have efficiency of storage goes down uh, by 30%. And, and also on the way from the reservoir all the way to the field, so the distribution uh, irrigation system, you also you lose some water by leaks or also by evaporation until the field. And, and globally, actually, at the field, the, the efficiency right now is about 45% on average. And, and, and you can see here on, the, on those photos here, uh, when you, in addition to large dams, we can also uh, uh, store the water in a smaller scale uh, reservoirs and also check dams, field bonds, and so on. And, and those actually, they require, of course, that uh, we, we try to minimize the losses by evaporation as well as by seepage and the leakage through the lining. And here you can see here example from the UK where reservoirs are uh, covered by floating solar panels to minimize uh, the evaporation. However, of course, these reservoirs are, uh, are also provided with liners and those liners, they meet the British standards, which is uh, hydraulic conductivity of 10 to minus nine to minus nine meter per second. And that's the bridge standard for the liners in, in these reservoirs and also for the landfill sites. And also we, we, we try also to minimize uh, the, the, the losses by evaporation from the irrigation canals. And, and also uh, we do the lining here, as you can see, there is here a concrete sort of lining. Uh, that's the old fashion, of course, uh, system. And all the way from the reservoirs and to the canal lighting, to the canals, we, we, we try to minimize the, the losses by uh, seepage, uh, by uh, uh, yeah, leaks from cracks. And, and here we, we try very much to promote that water saving through the whole network of distribution. And, and also we, we try to promote the use of uh, modern irrigation systems that would use less uh, water and is more efficient, like here, the sprinkler system or center pivot system with nozzles very close to the ground. And that actually would reduce the losses by evaporation and also by wind drift. And also we, we tried to minimize the, uh, the, the water losses by drip irrigation. And here an example of using twin drip lines and we put the plant in the middle and we, and each time one drip line also operates and the next irrigation, the other drip line. So at once, at one irrigation, we irrigate half of the vertical road zone and then we uh, irrigate the, the other half, the, the second irrigation. And that system would save 26% compared to the conventional drip irrigation and 44% compared to the sprinkler. And also we started to irrigate rice and this is an example of ICID, also working group on water and crops, where they started to, to grow rice using drip irrigation, and it has double benefit. One is to minimize methane, actually uh, emission, and helps mitigation the climate change, and also it saves a lot of water by using drip irrigation rather than rice with, with basic irrigation system. And we started also to move to nano irrigation, where you can have a flow rate of water from uh, that sort of tubes or uh, tip and would seep the, the water very slowly into the, the root zone of the plants and we can actually save a lot of water uh, from that. And also we are using something we call it uh, ultra low flow drip irrigation system that actually would reduce also the losses below the root zone and we can use flow rate of 0.1 to 0.3 liter per hour instead of the conventional drip uh, system that would use two liters to four liters per hour. And also we started to look at other technologies that would minimize the water losses and uh, improve the water use efficiency, like actually very uh, varying irrigation rate under center pivot. So in, under the center pivot here, we can irrigate with, with different rates and according to the need of each section across the span of the, uh, the, uh, the central pivot system. Um, water saving also can be done by using new technology because most of us, we calculate the crop water requirements uh, based on uh, either class A pan 
uh, or by using equation uh, from the FAO 56 or any other empirical equations. And these equations actually we discovered they are exaggerates the uh, amount of water that you need to apply for irrigation. And usually the crop water requirements are higher when we are using these equations. So we started to use uh, scintillometer here and that can work uh, across uh, a sec uh, uh, transect of maybe up to 10 kilometers and over a mosaic of different crops. And they can give you the actual evaporation over 10 kilometers mosaic of crops. And, and also we started to use any covariance to calculate the actual evaporation, which is the, the actual demand for soil and, and, and the crop for water. And instead of the, um, the other method that they, they represent the atmospheric demand rather than the crop demand. And we discovered actually from using centrometry and, and the edico, uh, edico covariance that the crop water requirements calculated by direct measurements could be actually uh, more that could save more than 50% of the water uh, compared to the equations we used uh, because we what what i uh, what we uh, we see is most of these equations are based on measuring meteorological uh, parameters like wind speed radiation and so on and therefore represents the atmospheric demand for water rather than the crop demand for water while these instruments they measure the actual flux of evaporation and basically when you add the water, you add the water that's really needed only uh, for the crop. The other thing we also used as a new technology is we used actually cosmic ray, which is uh, the cosmic rays are natural rays coming from the uh, stratospheres uh, to the earth. And, and actually it is uh, quite uh, safe to use compared to neutron probes uh, that we used in the past. And it is non-invasive and it gives you uh, 300 to 700 meter radius integrated value of soil moisture. And that soil moisture can be converted into soil moisture deficit, which is exactly the amount of water that you need to apply for irrigation. And across the UK, we have about 52 stations for Cosmos where we can measure the soil moisture in real time. And we can predict if there is a runoff is likely to happen with the next event. And we can also make uh, precaution uh, measurements if we expect some flood. Uh, and here you can see from the Cosmos measurements that we can see here the, uh, the soil moisture uh, over the time in response to the rainfall. <clears throat> and this seems to be very sensitive to the rainfall. And also we can, from the soil moisture, we can calculate the soil moisture deficit, which is a measure for crop water requirements. And if it's a green, we don't irrigate. If it's amber, we also don't irrigate, it means mild stress. But if it goes to red, then this area here, it gives you indication you should irrigate. So the, the, the coming events now for ICID, if we'd like to know more of what we are doing, uh, you, you are most welcome to join us in the next two events. One of them is the, the fifth African Regional Conference on Irrigation Drainage and the 72nd International Executive, Executive Council uh, with a theme sustainable management of irrigation for an improved resilience of agriculture in Africa. That's in Marrakesh, Morocco, uh, November, uh, which is actually in uh, two weeks time. The second event I would also like to invite all of you to, to join us is the, the 24th International Congress in Irrigation and the Drainage and it will be in Adelaide in October next year. And, the, uh, and, and that will be really uh, be, uh, focusing on innovation and the research in agricultural water management and sustainable development, development goals. So I would like to, to invite you to, to come to these two meetings. And I hope that already we have more cooperation uh, in the future. And I thank you for the opportunity uh, to allow me to say a few words about ISID and to give you a flavor of what we do nowadays. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agab. It's a very, very interesting work you're doing, very comprehensive approach on, uh, on water management throughout the world. So now we have uh, Dr. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Abdel Atif, who is going to introduce to us the situation in Egypt in particular. 
So, uh, His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Abdel Ati, Minister of Water Resource and Irrigation of Egypt, member of Water and Climate Leader Panel. He received his PhD in Irrigation and Hydraulics. He obtained his license of Hydraulic Engineering from Sweden and had his master's degree from the UK in Management and Implementation of Development Projects. In 2006, Dr. Ati received two MWRI World Water Day Celebration for Best Research Awards, and in 2001, he received the Medal of Excellence in Engineering. He is a water resources planner and manager with more than 30 years of academic research in addition to national, regional, and international practical experience in formulating, monitoring, and evaluating water plans and development policies. Dr. Ati has a solid, solid international experience in climate change impact assessment on water resource, infrastructure resiliency, agriculture, flood and disaster risk, uh, risk management, further to his broad experience in flood preparedness and early warning systems, as well as community preparedness, simulation and forecasting, flood risk mapping. He has effectively contributed to the second and fourth World Water Forum in Netherlands and in Mexico, respectively. He worked in several countries with different cultures and gained international experiences worldwide, notably in Africa. He, possessed, he possesses many expertises in premises and construction management and structural design. So, His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Abdel Abdi, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like first to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about the water situation in Egypt and share. Uh, some experience with you. Uh, in fact, I enjoyed the introduction uh, of both IGS and uh, ICID. Um, I wish that I could have uh, some more time to, uh, to attend the whole uh, session. Uh, as you can see here, Egypt is a dry country, a hyper arid country, uh, one of the driest in the world and also we are relying on our water, 97% of our water, our dependency ratio on the Nile. Uh, so are uh, extremely sensitive to any change in the Nile flow. And uh, uh, this is, uh, as you see here, a desert and 100 million people concentrated along this narrow strip of the uh, Nile uh, uh, River. Uh, and in, in terms of rainfall, as, as you can see that uh, it is very uh, small amount of rainfall, it varies from just the blue one here, 200 millimeter a year, and going down to Cairo, almost zero millimeter of rain. So this puts more pressure on us. Uh, climate change will have, of course, major impacts, either in terms of sea level rise or heat waves, and also uncertainty about the Nile uh, inflow. This will result in uh, more uh, pressure on water management uh, in addition to other uh, challenges like population uh, growth, uh, uh, limited uh, renewable water resources, all the canal uh, and hydraulic structures that need rehabilitation, water quality, public awareness, financing, and uh, governance also in terms of laws and legislation. Uh, if we look at the water balance, it is imbalanced, and we bring this uh, balance by, uh, I mean, importing uh, virtual food or, or virtual water, as well as recycling water. We are uh, one of the highest countries, maybe we are the highest in the world uh, in, uh, uh, import, uh, in recycling water. Uh, so we have uh, tailored these challenges into water strategy 2050, uh, converted it to National Water Resources Plan 2017-2037. This plan actually will require investments varies from 50 billion US dollar to 100 billion US dollar. And this is a major challenge to mobilize this uh, big amount of investments. That is a must to keep uh, uh, the minimum water security for Egypt. So this plan have four pillars, enhancing water quality. This is uh, pillar number one. Uh, rationalizing water use efficiency, uh, develop water resources, new water resources, and we are uh, mainly will rely on desalination of sea water as well as the small dams for uh, little rain that we harvest uh, every year. Then creating enabling environment in terms of training, in terms of uh, capacity building, in terms of uh, legislation, 
uh, in terms of finance mobilization, creating awareness and all this. Actually, and creating awareness is very important, not only to the grassroots, but uh, creating awareness to, uh, uh, to, to up also to the higher uh, political level uh, to get the political support of uh, uh, the president and the prime minister. And this is vital uh, to uh, get, uh, I mean, uh, the support. And so creating awareness, not only at the level of uh, water users, but also at higher levels to get them accommodated with water challenges. We converted this into programs uh, for canal rehabilitation, introducing modern irrigation, uh, rehabilitation of major uh, infrastructure, groundwater management uh, systems. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, this actually uh, captured with awareness capacity building cam uh, campaigns and finance in addition to a new uh, water resources law to uh, meet the challenges that we are facing. This is the status of uh, canals before lining, and uh, we have uh, faced with um, losses, either in conveyance losses or uh, seepage uh, losses, as well as injustice in water distribution. And this was a major challenge that created conflict among uh, farmers that reaches sometimes to uh, I mean, fighting each other. Uh, and uh, in one of the governorates, uh, it is an oasis, uh, the uh, crimes in the governorate, 80% are water related. So it was uh, a must for us to uh, start this program for canal rehabilitation. Uh, this uh, canal rehabilitation uh, project is uh, aims at uh, uh, rehabilitating about 20,000 kilometer long of canals. Within, uh, we, we are supposed to finish, we started last year, and we are uh, supposed to finish in three years' time. And this is a challenge because you have to maintain the network operational as well as uh, you have to uh, do the lining of the uh, uh, canals. And this is the plan. Uh, so uh, currently we have finished uh, 3,200 kilometer long and we are working in total uh, in 9,000 kilometer long this year, this fiscal year. And uh, in the next two years, from starting from uh, 2022, 23, 23, 24, we are planning to rehabilitate another 13,000 kilometer long of uh, canals. And this actor requires a lot of investment, but it is a must. In fact, actually, this canal rehabilitation project uh, helped in uh, accommodating the COVID uh, impacts by creating uh, job opportunities uh, for specially uh, those low-income uh, uh, layer of the uh, Egyptian uh, people, and uh, it is labor-intensive, so uh, it created jobs as well as we benefited from uh, uh, equity uh, and uh, enhancement of uh, water management. Uh, adding to that, actually, we are lining also the internal mescas uh, with different uh, techniques, either uh, uh, tubes or uh, uh, pipelines or uh, open channel according to the needs of the farmers because we uh, one key important uh, factor here that we have to involve the farmers themselves either in uh, construction or in operation or in the method of the construction to meet their needs and uh, uh, and actually uh, the difficult thing to convince uh, I mean uh, farmers to convert to this uh, uh, lining system as well as to convert to drip irrigation, which is also another ambitious program that uh, is aiming at uh, converting about 3.7 uh, million acres into uh, uh, modern irrigation. Now we have converted 3 million, uh, but there is remaining 3.7 million that we must convert to modern irrigation to adapt to climate change, as well as to meet our increasing uh, demand and improve water quality. And this will reduce our reliance actually on uh, recycling uh, water. By this, I think I give you a, a just a quick snapshot and I'm happy actually to be among you and uh, enjoy the uh, uh, participation in this uh, webinar. And thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, the situation in is Egypt is very well described, and uh, I think we're all here happy to, to be able to, to offer, to explain what we have to offer as an industry and to, to help you, to help you uh, reach your goals. 
So uh, following this uh, presentation, I think we're going to now go with uh, Dr. Giroux's presentation. Um, so Dr. Giroux is an international expert in geocinetics and in particular geomembranes used in dams, canals and reservoirs. Mm -hmm. He has more than 50 years he has more than 50 years of experience with geoscientics and has worked on projects in all continents. He coined the terms geotextile and geomembrane in 1977. Uh, he's a former professor of geotechnical engineering. He's a founder and former chairman of a large consulting company. He's a past president of the IGS. He's a member of the United States National Academy of Engineering. He has developed many of the design methods used in geoscientics engineering, in, in particular for liner system and leakage control. He has developed numerous keynote lectures and prestigious lectures, such as the Vienna Terzaghi Lecture, the Mercer Lecture Series, the Terzaghi Lecture of the American Society of Civil Engineers, the highest honor bestowed on a geotechnical engineer in the United States. Dr. Giroux has authored more than 400 publications, and he is currently preparing a book on geomembranes for lining canals with Hervé Puskelec to be published in 2022, in the forthcoming year. So with this introduction, Dr. Giroux, I'm going to let you uh, present uh, your presentation. Part of my screen is hidden by photos. Do you hear me? Yes, you can move the bar where there are the pictures, JP. Uh, you, you click on this bar and you move it to the side of your screen. What should I do? With, with your mouse, you take the bar where you have all those pictures of people and you, you click on it and you move it on the side of your screen. You can move this bar where, where you have all the pictures. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Excellency, colleagues and all participants, I will talk about geosynthetics in canals. There are many types of geosynthetics and even more types of geosynthetics. First, let's focus on geomembranes because they are the watertight uh, geosynthetics. And indeed, leakage control is an essential goal in canal design. Geomembranes are flexible sheets of watertight material, generally polymeric, sometimes bituminous. Polymeric geomembranes, bituminous geomembranes. And the flexibility of geomembranes is evident on these two photos. Geomembranes are produced in rolls. And here we see rolls delivered to the site. The rolls are unrolled to form flat panels, which are then seamed together. And panels are steam, seamed together in the field to form large liners. The rolls can also be seamed together in a factory to form large panels that are packed and delivered at the construction site where they are deployed. Panels are then seamed together in the field. In many applications, geomembranes are associated with geotextile. And generally, the geotextile is used to protect the geomembrane. Here we see a geotextile on top of a geomembrane. Here, a geotextile below a geomembrane. The surface condition of a geomembrane is important. If low friction is desired, 
a geomembrane with a smooth surface is used. If high friction is desired, a geomembrane with a rough surface is used. Here are examples of a smooth surface on the left and several types of rough surface. Another important aspect of geomembrane surface is the color. Geomembranes are generally black because they are protected from ultraviolet radiation by carbon black, which consists of fine particles of carbon mixed with the polymer at the manufacturing stage. But black color exposed to sunlight results in high temperature, which has detrimental effects such as accelerated aging and thermal expansion. Geomembranes with a white surface or a reflective surface have a lower temperature. It was mentioned earlier that geomembranes are flexible. <clears throat> More importantly, geomembranes are extensible. Extensibility is an essential property. Geomembranes remain watertight even after significant elongation. This is illustrated in the following slide. This geomembrane remained watertight after deflecting into a depression. This geomembrane remained watertight in spite of deflection into a depression and deformation over protruding blocks. This geomembrane remained watertight in spite of extensive bank deformation due to wave action. This geomembrane remained watertight in spite of bulging due to water trapped under the geomembrane liner. This geomembrane remained watertight even though it was inflated by gas emanating from the landfill. This geomembrane remained watertight in spite of extensive deformation due to organic gas from the ground. This geomembrane remained watertight in spite of extensive deformation due to protruding stones as a result of erosion of the ground under the geomembrane. This geomembrane remained watertight after elongation in a multi action test. These examples show that geomembranes are extensible. Therefore, geomembranes can accommodate significant deformation of the supporting medium and undergo large extension while remaining watertight. Extensibility is a major advantage of geomembranes compared to concrete. <laughs> geomembranes are used in a variety of applications to contain water and other liquids, as well as gas in some cases. In these applications, all types of geomembranes are used, polymeric geomembranes, and bituminous geomembrane. An irrigation reservoir lined with a geomembrane, the waste disposal landfill lined with a geomembrane, the wastewater reservoir lined with a geomembrane. At the Panama Canal, the water basins for the new locks are lined with geomembrane. Fish farms lined with geomembranes geomembrane used as landfill cover, mining facilities lined with geomembrane, railway tunnels lined with geomembranes, embankment dam with a geomembrane upstream face and a concrete dam with a geomembrane upstream face. And in addition to that, for decades, Geomembranes have been used in a variety of canals. 
hydro power canals, navigation canals, irrigation canals, large canals, as well as small canals. The geomembrane can be protected <laughs> or can be exposed. Four runners of geomembranes were used in canals in the 50s and the 60s. Examples include asphalt sprayed on chute and mostly uh, films of PVC and polyethylene, typically 0.2 millimeter thick. An example of asphalt sprayed on jute in the 50s the first canal lined with a PVC film in 54. Here, an early installation of a PVC film in 61. Here, an early installation of polyethylene film in the 60s. And this polyethylene film is protected with precast concrete panels. And this is typical of the numerous uses of films in canals in the former Soviet Union in the 60s and the 90s. The thin films used in these applications were not modern geomembranes, which are generally thicker than one millimeter. However, significant experience was gained from those early installation. More details on the use of geomembranes in canals can be found in the book, the Geomembranes for Lining Canals, which I am preparing with my colleague, uh, Plus Kelec, and to be published in 2022. In spite of this long history of geomembranes used in canals, and in spite of the fact that geomembranes are today the dominant watertight materials in landfills, water reservoirs, mining applications, etc., many canals are still lined with concrete. There are two types of concrete lining, cast in situ concrete and precast concrete panel. Cast in situ concrete linings are used in particular in large canals and are placed using this type of uh, large lining machinery called paving machine. But cast in situ concrete are also used in medium size and small canals. As I said, there are two types, cast in situ concrete and precast concrete panels. Let's see now examples of precast concrete panels. They are typically installed using hand labor and typically used in small canals. Now, the preceding slides show that there is considerable experience with concrete lining. And it is important to understand the state of practice of concrete linings to evaluate the revolution that geomembranes and other geosynthetics are bringing to this field. Concrete linings have drawbacks. Concrete linings are not flexible and not extensible. As a result, concrete linings tend to crack if they are not uniformly supported by the soil because of differential settlement, uh, localized subsidence, uh, dissolution of gypsum in soil, collapse of less type soil, erosion of soil under the lining, and instability of soil under the lining. In contrast, with concrete linings, which are not flexible and not extensible, geomembranes are flexible and extensible. So unlike concrete linings, geomembranes remain watertight 
even if they are not uniformly supported by the underlying soil. Here we see a longitudinal crack in a concrete line. Longitudinal cracking is typical of canals lined with cast in situ concrete. Longitudinal cracking is due to differential settlement. In particular, if the lower part of the canal is in cut and the upper part is in fill. So a horizontal joint filled with a sealant is often used to prevent longitudinal cracking of cast in situ concrete line. Here is an example of horizontal joint, but it did not prevent extensive cracking in this case. Um, I even saw that uh, the, the owner of the canal tried to seal the crack with adhesive tape, which was of course unsuccessful. The failure of this cast in situ concrete lining was caused by dissolution of the soil by water leaking from the canal. This canal is located in an area where the soil has a high content of gypsum. And gypsum is soluble in water. So water leaking through joints and through small cracks of the concrete lining dissolved some gypsum, which caused soil subsidence, which increased the concrete cracking, thereby increasing leakage, which caused more gypsum dissolution, which resulted in more subsidence, which further opened crack and joints, and so on, until the canal was put out of commission. And at the same site, the concrete lining collapsed into a cavity uh, formed by gypsum dissolution, as we can see here. As seen in this example, water leaking through concrete cracks can cause a major failure if the soil is sensitive to water. And in the Middle East, several failures of concrete lined canals have been caused by gypsum dissolution. These canals have been repaired using geomembrane lining. Now, gypsum dissolution occurs in arid zones, in particular in the Middle East, but is relatively rare in the rest of the world. However, everywhere in the world, similar problems are caused by erosion, water leaking through initial cracks or through joints in the concrete lining erodes the soil under the concrete lining. As a result of erosion of the soil, the concrete lining is no longer uniformly supported. This causes cracking of cast in situ concrete lining and causes differential displacement of precast concrete element. This is shown on the last, next slide. We see here an example of differential settlement affecting precast concrete element. The preceding slides show that there are several mechanisms that deteriorate concrete lining. Therefore, the number of canal linings have been repaired or need to be repaired. There are many examples of defective concrete line canals that have been repaired using geomembranes, but there are no examples of geomembrane line canals that have been repaired using concrete lining. It should be noted that many geomembrane linings 
having excellent performance, are protected with concrete. So a good way to use concreted canals is as protective layer of the geomembrane lining. The geomembrane ensures water tightness while the concrete ensures protection. So we will discuss uh, water tightness in the following slides. Now, in the preceding slides, we have seen that geomembranes are flexible and extensible and therefore remain watertight even if they are not uniformly supported by the underlying soil. In contrast, we have seen that concrete linings exhibit cracks and therefore do not remain watertight. So evaluation of water leakage from canals is presented in the following slide. Estimates of water leakage from canals based on theory, field measurements, and experience are presented in detail in the book we are preparing. And a summary of the conclusions of the book are presented here. Here are estimated water leakage from canals for a typical depth of water of three meters. In the case of an unlined canal on a typical silty or sandy soil, the leakage rate is about from 100 to 1,000 millimeters per day. And in fact, the value of 250 millimeters per day is often mentioned as typical. In the case of a concrete lining in good condition, the leakage rate is 25 to 50 millimeters per day. But if the concrete lining is in poor condition, then it exceeds 100 millimeters per day. For a geomembrane, when installed, the rate of leakage is 0 0.1 to 1 millimeter per day. If the geomembrane is poorly installed, it can be up to 10 millimeters per day. But if a geomembrane has very large holes, then the rate of leakage is greater than 100 millimeters per day. So these numbers show that first leakage control is 100 times more effective uh, with geomembrane than with concrete. By the way, it should be noted that the values given for concrete in the preceding slides are only for uh, cast in situ concrete linings. Uh, in the case of precast concrete linings, the rate of leakage is uh, larger. A leakage analysis based on experimental data and theoretical calculation shows that even thin cracks in concrete result in significant leakage, which is significant to deteriorate the underlying soil, for example, by erosion, thereby creating poor support condition and therefore more leakage. Here, I want to make an important comment. Based on the results presented, both a concrete lining in poor condition and a geomembrane with very large holes are not better than an unlined soil. Consequently, precautions should be taken to prevent the development of large holes in geomembrane. So these precautions include proper selection of the materials, selection of high quality geomembrane, selection of geomembrane thickness, proper selection of the materials adjacent to the geomembrane, proper selection of geotextiles to protect the geomembrane, and proper selection of the cover material, which can be concrete soil layer, but we will also see that it can be uh, geosynthetic systems. Precautions to prevent large holes in geomembranes also include 
proper geotechnical design to minimize the displacement of the soil and the appurtenant structures, proper compaction of the soil supporting the geomembrane, quality control and construction quality assurance of geomembrane installation, including electric leak location survey and careful maintenance operation. Now, questions are often asked about the durability of geomembrane. Durability is often treated as if it were an intrinsic property of a given geomembrane. In fact, it is more appropriate to consider the service life that can be predicted for a given geomembrane in a given structure, such as a given canal. For modern geomembrane supplied by experienced manufacturers and covered with an adequate protective layer, a service life longer than 100 years can generally be predicted. Now, for exposed geomembranes, the service life depends on the geomembrane type, composition, and thickness, and of course, the exposure conditions. So the predicted service life of exposed geomembrane may vary in a wide range from 20 to 100 years. Now, this is an important comment. Concerns about durability are pointless if uh, in the case of premature failure of the geomembrane. Premature failures occur too frequently. Failure during construction or as a consequence of construction due to lack of survivability of the geomembrane or inadequate design of the line structure. Failure in early stage of service occurs because of inadequate design of the line structure. So failures due to inadequate design are a greater concern than durability, hence the need to educate engineers and methods for the safe design of geomembrane linings have been published and used in reservoir, landfills, dams, and canals. They were published in two special issues of Geosynthetics International, an official journal of the International Geosynthetic Society. Now, let's review a few examples of canals lined with a geomembrane. We'll start with the first example of modern canal design. In the mid 70s, the era of thin plastic films was over and modern geomembranes were being used. The Esfahan Canal constructed in Iran in 76-79 was the first large irrigation canal lined with a geomembrane, not a plastic film, a real geomembrane. Canal is four meter deep, 15 meter wide, 50 kilometer long. The existing concrete lining constructed in the early 70s deteriorate, deteriorated rapidly due to dissolution of gypsum present in the ground. The dissolution of gypsum was caused by water leaking through cracks in the concrete and through defective joints. And soil subsidence due to gypsum dissolution increased the cracks open the joints, thereby increasing leakage and so on. As a result, 
the existing concrete lining was severely cracked five years after construction. Only five years after construction. So the canal had to be relined. And since concrete was not working, it was clear even as early as 1975 that a geomembrane had to be used. And at that time, the geomembrane of choice was butyl rubber. The specifications called for a, minimum, a maximum leakage rate of one millimeter per day. As we know, this is it's easily achieved with a geomembrane. But the challenge was to meet this goal with a geomembrane placed on concrete with cracks that could evolve with time and where new cracks could appear. In 1975, this was a new challenge. So an extensive theoretical study was undertaken and the study showed that placing a geotextile next to the geomembrane would significantly reduce the tensile stress in the geomembrane. As a result of this study, the following configuration was adopted. From top to bottom, concrete, non-woven geotextile, geomembrane, non-moving geotextile again under the geomembrane and below either uh, the existing concrete lining with cracks or excavated soil for the new canal. Here is the adopted cross section for the Hesfahan canal. And the role of the geotextile above the geomembrane was protection of the geomembrane during construction reinforcement of concrete during placement of concrete on the slope and drainage of excess water from the fresh concrete. The role of the geotextile below the geomembrane was protection of the geomembrane from puncturing by the underlying concrete with cracks. It was to be a low friction interlayer, decreasing stresses in the geomembrane when a crack opens in the existing concrete lining and support of geomembrane to prevent the geomembrane from bursting under water pressure while bridging cracks of the existing concrete lining. 750,000 square meter of beauty rubber geomembrane and 1.5 million square meter of geotextile were installed in this canal. And at that time, it was the largest uh, geomembrane project in the world. Let's see a few slides. Geomembrane unrolled on top of the geotextile. The prefabricated panels were 16 meters per 15 meter. Two panels were placed and seamed every day. We see here the historic seaming machine for beauty rubber geomembrane. Needless to say that modern seaming machines are much smaller and more sophisticated, as we can see in this comparison of the machines we used in 75 and the machine on the right that we use today. A general view during construction with geomembrane on top of geotextile. The geomembrane was protected by concrete. At the bottom, it was unreinforced concrete. On the slope, it was reinforced concrete, at least at the beginning of the construction. Uh, it was very labor intensive, as you can see here, to place concrete on the slope, uh, but still the test showed that unreinforced concrete was stable when cast on geotextile, but was unstable 
when cast directly on the geomembrane. So the geotextile ensured stability by providing a reinforcement of fresh concrete and drainage of excess water from the fresh concrete. So therefore, unreinforced concrete was adopted uh, for the rest of the project. Here, the odd number concrete panel have just been uh, installed, have just been completed, and then the even number of concrete panels were cast with open joints between all panels. The Esfahan Canal is still in service 45 years after being lined with butyl rubber uh, geomembrane. Today, butyl rubber has been replaced by another elastomer, EPDM, which is even more durable than butyl rubber. <clears throat> so here are a few examples of this new elastomeric geomembrane in a concrete canal and in an earth canal. Now, the presentation of the Esfahan Canal showed the rehabilitation of an existing canal using a geomembrane. The next example presents a new canal lined with a geomembrane. The Toshka New Valley Project, also known as Toshka Project, is a large irrigation project in Egypt launched in 1997. This is perhaps the largest geosynthetic project in the world with 20 million square meters of geomembrane. The canal is 60 meters wide, 7.5 meters deep, with slopes 2 to 1, which is not steep compared to the typical 1.5 to 1 in a canal. Uh, safety was considered more important than economy, which is remarkable and not frequent in irrigation canals where the budget is often tight. Uh, this approach led to the selection of a relatively thick geomembrane protected by thick concrete layer placed on slopes that are not too steep. And we will uh, use the simple term Toshka Canal in the following slides. The cross section of the Toshka Canal, the main canal is as shown here with a 300 millimeter of concrete shot crete on top of the geomembrane. And in particular, there is no geotextile in this cross section. Also, a special detail of the Toshka Canal is that there is no anchor trench at the crest of the side slopes. As a result, 700,000 square meters of geomembranes were saved. We see here the crest of the side slope with no anchor trench. Now, the absence of anchor trench required that concrete placement be done shortly after seeming to promptly ballast the geomembrane. So here we see the concrete placement machine closely following the seeming operation. To avoid the formation of wrinkles in the HDP geomembrane at the Toshka Canal, the geomembrane was installed at night and early morning, in particular in the summer. Indeed, wrinkles are a known problem with HD, HDP geomembranes as illustrated on the next slide. You see here the canal uh, with uh, many, many, many wrinkles on the side slope. Wrinkles result from thermal expansion. And if a geomembrane is to be covered by concrete, as in Toshka Canal, wrinkles make concrete placement difficult. Therefore, 
the geomembrane temperature should be kept as low as possible. The most effective way is to construct at night, which was done at Koshka Canal. Another possibility is to use a geomembrane with a white surface or a reflective surface. And clearly, <clears throat> as we see here, wrinkles are controlled by using geomembranes with white surface or reflective surface. <laughs> the examples presented so far showed the use of polymeric geomembranes. The following slides will present the use of bituminous geomembrane. A bituminous geomembrane is essentially a non-woven geotextile impregnated and coated with bitumen. And here we see a typical placement of bituminous geomembrane directly uh, on prepared soil. Bituminous geomembranes have also been used for the rehabilitation of concrete canals, as we see here. In the preceding examples, geomembranes were either exposed or covered by concrete panels or cast in situ concrete. Now, leaving a geomembrane exposed has some advantages. The cost is minimized and the flow of water is faster if smooth geomembrane is used. However, covering of a geomembrane has more advantages. This is discussed on this slide. Covering of a geomembrane has many advantages. Protection against deterioration by animals and humans. Protection against damage by falling objects and hair. Protection against temperature variation. Protection against solar radiation. Ballasting the geomembrane seams against peeling. Ballasting the geomembrane against uplift by wind. And ballasting the geomembrane against displacement by action of water. The last item, displacement by action of water, deserves an explanation. The drag force due to flowing water tend to displace the geomembrane. However, if the geomembrane is in intimate contact with the underlying medium, the material, the geomembrane is not displaced because the interface friction forces beneath the geomembrane are higher than the drag forces above the geomembrane. This is illustrated here. The friction force is higher than the drag force if, if there is intimate contact between the geomembrane and the supporting material. But if the geomembrane is uplifted, there is no longer intimate contact between the geomembrane and the supporting material. As a result, the drag forces are not counteracted by interface friction forces under the geomembrane. Therefore, in this case, the geomembrane is dragged downstream unless it is properly anchored or ballasted. Here is a canal where the geomembrane left of the anchorage beam was uplifted and then removed by the drag forces. And the pieces we see here are only pieces of geotextiles initially under the geomembrane, and they remained here after the geomembrane had been completely removed. It is important to understand the mechanism of geomembrane uplift. The uplift mechanism is triggered by a hole in the geomembrane. 
if there is no hole in the geomembrane, the static pressure applied by the water present in the canal keeps the geomembrane in contact with the underlying medium and the drag forces are not effective. But if there is a hole in the geomembrane and if water leaking through this hole accumulates under the geomembrane. In other words, if the material under the geomembrane is not draining, the dynamic pressure is established under the geomembrane in accordance with the general Bernoulli's equation. The water pressure beneath the geomembrane is then the total pressure given by this equation. Whereas the water pressure above the geomembrane is simply the static pressure uh, given by this straightforward equation. The geomembrane is then uplifted by the difference between those two pressures, which is called the dynamic pressure. And it is interesting to compare geomembrane uplift by water flow in canals with the well-known phenomenon of geomembrane uplift by wind. Indeed, the same equation is used for the two mechanisms. And the calculation using this equation shows that the possibility of geomembrane uplift in a canal is similar to the possibility of geomembrane uplift by wind. In the equation, the velocity is squared, as we can see. In a canal, the flow velocity is low, let's say one meter per second, compared to wind velocity, which can be, for example, 30 meters per second. Therefore, the velocity, velocity squared ratio may be 900 between those two cases in favor of wind, 900 in favor of wind. But, but water density is 800 times the density of air. So therefore, <clears throat> the two phenomena are equivalent and geomembrane uplift by flowing water is as likely as geomembrane uplift by wind. <clears throat> Clearly, geomembranes in canals must be anchored and or ballasted to prevent them from being uplifted and then dragged by the flow of water. <clears throat> in addition, as I mentioned earlier, it is always beneficial to cover a geomembrane by a protective layer <clears throat> against a variety of possible damage or deterioration. Therefore, it is generally recommended to cover geomembrane. And we have seen examples of canals where the geomembrane lining is protected or, and or ballasted by concrete. But Protection and ballasting can also be done by a variety of systems using different types of geosynthetics. But it is important to note that the systems I will present in the following slides can perform several functions. They can protect and or ballast the geomembrane as we discussed, but they can also be used without a geomembrane for erosion control and or bank stabilization. And some of them can even control leakage in addition to erosion control and bank stabilization, thereby active as a watertight lining, but possibly less effective than a geomembrane. Let's review those systems. The simplest one, slope protection using rocks. In this case, the stability of rocks on slopes is a challenge. Here is a very large canal 
lined with a geomembrane, a geogrid placed on a geotextile, which is used to protect the geomembrane, is used in this case to ensure the stability of the rocks. <clears throat> and here we have three geosynthetics on top of each other, the geogrid, which is on the geotextile, which is on the geomembrane. By the way, we see the geomembrane on the other side of this very large canal. Another way to ensure rock stability is to use gabions on geotextile. Another system is articulated concrete blocks supported by a geotextile. And here we see a typical installation frame and we can appreciate the flexibility of this uh, system of articulated blocks. Geomats are tortuous structures with very coarse fibers. And there is excellent interlocking between a geomat and soil. Hence the use of geomats for erosion control. Here is an example of geomat installed on a slope for erosion control. And we see the growth of vegetation through the geomat. Erosion control products are also made with natural fibers and those materials are now adopted in the geosynthetic discipline. We see an example of erosion control with natural fibers with growth of vegetation through those uh, materials. Another system is sand geotextile composite used for bank protection. We see here a cross section with a layer of sand between two layers of non-woven geotextile. And this material uh, can be installed under water, which is of course an interesting uh, consideration. Bank protection can also be used with geocells. A geocell consists of multiple cells and each cell is to be filled with soil or concrete. Here is an example of a geocell placed on a geotextile for bank protection. Here the geocells are filled with soil for bank protection and also for the growth of vegetation. Now the geocells can also, also be filled with concrete in this case, it is for bank protection, but also for leakage control. Bank protection can also be done using geomatrices. A geomatrice consists of two parallel fabrics attached with strings. And we see here the geomatrice after filling with concrete the space between the, the two fabrics. We see here in the field, the geomatrice being filled uh, with concrete, which is pumped between the two layers of fabric. There are different shapes of geomatrices. And here is an example of canal erosion control and at the same time leakage control with the geomatrice. Uh, the geosynthetic systems presented in the pre preceding slide can be used in different ways, as I already said. They can be used to protect and or ballast geomembrane lining. They can be used without geomembrane to control erosion. And the systems, those uh, systems that are filled with concrete can also be used without geomembrane to serve as low permeability lining. So if those systems which are filled with concrete and can be used as low permeability lining are the geocells and the geomatrices. We should understand that in this case, the lining is concrete. So in fact, this is a way to construct a concrete lining. 
At this point, I want to say that there is an innovative type of geomatrix which comprises two geomembranes rather than two fabric. The upper geomembrane is a woven fabric coated with PVC. The lower geomembrane is a high quality composite geomembrane that consists of a PVC geomembrane bonded to a non-woven geotextile. This is an example of a canal lining uh, constructed under water. Uh, the two geomembranes are installed under water and then are filled with concrete under water. So this system is designed to be installed under water while water is flowing in the canal. The two geomembranes of these special geomatrices have different functions. The upper geomembrane prevents dispersion of cement into the canal water during underwater installation. The lower geomembrane is a watertight canal lining. There is a major difference between the classical geomatrix where concrete is contained between two fabrics, which are permeable, and the innovative geomatrix that I just presented where concrete is contained between two geomembranes, which are watertight. In case of the fabric form geomatrix, the classical one, the canal lining is concrete, in the case of geomembrane formed geomatrix, the canal lining is a high quality geomembrane. So as shown in this presentation, we know of course that geomembranes are superior to concrete for leakage control. Another way to associate concrete and geosynthetics is a concrete geocomposite. We see here a schematic cross section with a dry concrete mix between two uh, layers of fibers. And at the bottom, there is either a thin film or a real geomembrane. We see here the installation of the, this material and we can appreciate its flexibility. In addition to concrete, another usual low permeability material, bentonite, can be used to line canals. Here is a bentonite geocomposite, also known as GCL. Uh, we will see the cross section on the next slide. It is essentially a layer of bentonite between two layers of geotextile. And this uh, system can be installed under water. It is time now to conclude this presentation. This review of geosynthetics in canals show that geosynthetics offer all possibilities. Geomembranes are far superior to all of their materials for water tightness. Geosynthetics other than geomembrane may provide a degree of water tightness that is sufficient in some situations. And several geosynthetic systems <laughs> provide protection, erosion control, bank stabilization. In summary, geosynthetics in canals offer all possibilities with superior performance. Therefore, geosynthetics should be the material of choice for all canal applications. However, there are still engineers who systematically prefer concrete to line canals. Many engineers prefer concrete because they prefer traditional solutions. Many engineers prefer concrete because they prefer hard solutions, even though flexibility and extensibility ensure better performance as shown in this presentation. Mm. Essentially, many engineers prefer concrete 
because they are not informed of the possibilities offered by geosynthetic. So clearly, we need to educate engineers who line canal, who design canals. And therefore, I hope that many of you will be able to use the information presented in the book as an education tool as, and, a guide for, and a guide for the use of geosynthetics in canals. Now, using geosynthetics in canals is a way to address the challenge of water conservation. 93.5% of precipitation water that falls on land infiltrates in landscape evaporates or return to the ocean. 5% falls directly on cultivated soil. Only 1% is used by mankind in an organized manner. Of the 1.5% of precipitation water used by mankind in an organized manner, 1.4% is used for irrigation, 0.1% is used for human consumption and industry. So in other words, irrigation uses more than 90% of the water used by mankind. Therefore, leakage from irrigation canals is a major cause of water waste. So we have seen that geomembranes used in canal reduce leakage significantly. Therefore, using geomembranes in canals is perhaps the most effective way to save water in the world. Thus, by using geomembranes and other geosynthetics in canals, we act in a way that is beneficial to society at large because water is one of the great challenges of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Giroux, for this uh, extraordinary presentation, very enlightening. Uh, I would like to remind the audience that, uh, to use the question and answer uh, platform uh, of the Zoom tool. So you can find this uh, in the middle of the screen in the bottom, you have a Q&A button. Uh, please click on this button and type your questions to Dr. Giroux or to Dr. Ragab or to Nathalie Tous, who's coming up, <clears throat> or myself. And uh, we will be glad to answer these questions at the end of the, of the session, so in probably uh, between half an hour and 45 minutes from now. Um, now I would like to introduce the next presentation uh, by Nathalie Tooze. So Nathalie Tooze is IGS Vice President. Dr. Tooze has been conducting research on geosynthetics for the past 27 years, with particular emphasis on hydraulic and environmental applications. She is the head of the EINRAE Center at Jouillan Josas Anthony, a French public research institute which has been at the forefront of geosynthetic research since 1972. I think Nathalie was not born then. <laughs> she has authored about 200 papers and serves or has served on a number of national technical committees, especially for the use of geosynthetic clay liners and geomembranes. Her experience has been acknowledged in the field of standardization, and she has served as convener of ISO WG4 on hydraulics and SEN TC189 on geosynthetics. She is the immediate past president of the Council of the French chapter of the IGS. She has been elected on the IGS Council twice in 2010 and 2014. Dr. Tooze uh, was a keynote lecturer at the EuroGeo4 and EuroGeo5 conferences. She was also an invited lecturer at the seventh international conference on environmental geotechnics in 2014 in Melbourne, Australia, and was awarded the sixth G Giroux lecture 
that was presented along the 11th International Conference on Geogenetics in Seoul, Korea in 2018. So Dr. Tooth, please. Thank you very much, Eric, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So yes, this afternoon I will deal about uh, geosynthetics that provide a sustainable solution for water management, especially in canals. Uh, Professor Yu has talked about it uh, a bit earlier, mentioning that sustainability was one of the key words in our everyday life. And this translates in the vision of the IGS. This vision says that uh, geosynthetics should be recognized to be fundamental to sustainable development uh, as they provide technological and engineering solutions to answer societal and environmental challenges. This vision translates into communication vectors. Uh, one of those communication vectors that has been developed or is currently developed by the IGS is the Did You Know series. You may have seen some of them. I encourage you all to take a look at the sustainability webpage on the IGS website. And this Did You Know uh, states that there is a significant contribution of geosynthetics and the IGS to the 17 sustainable development goals. How do geosynthetics and the IGS contribute to those sustainable development goals? Well, unequal solutions are possible. Uh, Dr. Professor Jean-Pierre Giroux has just mentioned about the fact that uh, the reduction of flicks and to the use of geomembranes uh, cannot be compared to what you obtain with, uh, with concrete. It's much, much more, uh, uh, it's a much better um, protection and conservation of water thanks to the use of geomembranes. So that surface and groundwater is preserved and safeguarded also from contamination. Geosynthetics are sustainable techniques that ensure the reduction in energy consumption and emissions. This is another aspect. And um, other construction materials can be replaced and especially reduced in terms of their use and, uh, and digging in the soil to, to get those materials. And finally, the economic growth and welfare is enabled thanks to the use of geosynthetics. So that geosynthetics provide both environmental and economic benefits. And this is what I am going to illustrate uh, today during my presentation. This is especially true along the freshwater cycle in which geosynthetics are used to ensure efficient capture, transportation, storage, and distribution of fresh water through dams, canals, reservoirs, tunnels, and pipes. And in those applications, geosynthetics, mainly geomembranes, hold the key via their use as barriers uh, in those applications. So dealing with now joint environmental and economic benefits, uh, there is a common misconception that sustainable solutions for infrastructure are more expensive. But a recent did you know as emphasis the contrary. Uh, indeed, uh, geosynthetic solutions were initially developed to provide financial benefits. In fact, we observe easier and or accelerated construction thanks to the use of geosynthetics. Furthermore, the works are usable immediately. And there are also long-term savings in relation with extending life by increasing the volume uh, through reducing the sickness and increasing also the stability on slope. Energy savings and environmental benefits then became obvious, especially through the reduction in emissions when you construct with geosynthetics. The recently published Did You Know by the IGS puts light on the fact that geosynthetics contribute to both cost effectiveness and sustainability up to the point that it is very hard to classify under economic or sustainable some advantages of the use of geosynthetics that are related to the reduction in energy, to the reduction of the quantity or need for select some material, and also to the reduction in long-term maintenance associated with significant contribution to the lifespan. Today, what I'm going to illustrate uh, is briefly is aspects that are related to the reduction in emissions and also to the less long-term maintenance associated with significant contribution to the lifespan. 
indeed, we we have some feedback now as regards uh, the the lifetime of uh, geosynthetics, and geosynthetics are designed for long term use. Uh, in fact, uh, based on feedback from in situ samplings on real infrastructure, not test on specimens after accelerated aging in the laboratory, we have evidence that has been collected, especially in dams that the service life of polyvinyl chloride plastified composite membranes will exceed 50 years. Uh, we also observe a good behavior of exposed high density polyethylene, a plastified polyvinyl chloride, uh, ethylene propylene DN monomer geomembranes in climatic conditions that are representative of the Canary Islands, 20 to 30 years after installation. They can last longer. It's just that at the moment, we do not necessarily have more data for um, longer durations. And we also observe a good behavior of exposed elastomeric bituminous geomembranes and covered oxidized bituminous geomembranes 30 years after installation. It has also been noticed that the lifetime of geomembranes is increased uh, when they are covered. And this effectiveness is not only observed at the scale of the material, but also in terms of the performance asserted uh, at, the, at the scale of the work itself. And those data uh, arise from uh, previous work from uh, Jean-Pierre Giroux and Hervé Pluskelec, who compared uh, the effectiveness of canals after 10 years in service or canals lined with concrete and canals lined with geomembranes and they defined the effectiveness as a reduction of seepage losses compared to unlined canals. And this effectiveness was 70% for canals lined with concrete, while it was 95% for canals lined with geomembranes, in relation especially with uh, this lack of continuity of the concrete um, when it is aging compared to the geomembrane that stands aging in a better way. In terms of the reduction in emissions now, the figure presented here at the right hand side of this slide illustrates how a truck of a barrier material can replace 150 trucks of filled with clay. It was previously shown by Professor Yu. As a consequence, it has been evident that geosynthetics contribute to a reduction of greenhouse gases emissions from construction compared to soils. The embodied carbon is an indicator of the cumulative carbon emissions used in the solution adopted uh, that sums uh, the emissions um, due to raw material extraction, to manufacturing, and also to transportation. Various studies have been uh, published in the past years as regards the use of geosynthetics compared to other solutions. And all those published studies to date conclude that solutions with geosynthetics are more sustainable than alternative solutions that use soil or concrete based on the embodied carbon values. The savings made using geosynthetics result in societal benefits. Uh, his Excellence, uh, Dr. Abdelati has previously mentioned the job creation in relation with canal lining. There are other uh, societal benefits uh, connected with the use of geosynthetics. This can be presented in a very simplistic manner as illustrated on this graph. Uh, a virtuous circle can be drawn in which the available money in relation with the previously mentioned savings that are made using geosynthetics can be invested depending on political decisions in more and better infrastructure, in healthcare, in education, for example. This investment results in healthier, better educated and efficient people. In a virtuous circle, this finally results in avoided cost and financial benefits again. When people are confident that their children will live in good conditions, be educated to prepare their future and live longer, the birth rate decreases. We are expecting right now a, a reduction in the population starting from the year 2064. People also become more concerned by the quality of their environment. The decrease of the population and the awareness of environmental issues should result in a positive impact on climate change and use of resources. In summary, uh, today I wanted to illustrate briefly how geosynthetics contribute to sustainability. 
especially as regards water management. I have shown that geosynthetics make significant contribution to the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations by their use in applications that serve in food production, environmental protection, infrastructure mitigation, or natural disaster, but especially focused on water today. Geosynthetic solutions also contribute to make significant economic savings, and thus they impact positively the economic growth and the reduction of inequalities. And finally, geosynthetic solutions minimize resource and energy consumption and emissions in relation with their unequal performance, whether it is intrinsic to the products, to the materials themselves, or to the transportation and installation processes. And this concludes my, uh, my brief presentation today, and I thank you for, for your attention. And I now have the task um, to give a brief introduction of uh, Eric Blom, who is the next speaker. So Eric uh, is an independent consultant who is offering technical services to the geosynthetics and engineered construction material industries. Eric has authored more than 100 technical papers and conferences. His main expertise is in soil filtration, drainage, lining systems, and the durability of geosynthetics. Is actively involved in several committees, such as ASTM D35, ISO TC221, the International Geosynthetic Society, the Canadian Geotechnical Society, among others, and is a professional engineer registered in Quebec and Alberta, Canada. Eric, your turn. So thank, <clears throat> thank you, Nathalie. So uh, I just when we developed this concept of having a, a workshop focusing on canal lining with geosynthetics, uh, we realized that's one of the recurring questions uh, coming up from, uh, from people not aware of the benefits of geosynthetics uh, and not familiar with this technology was really about the durability, the service life. How long can they, can they last? So I thought it would be worth doing a short presentation on the, on the durability of geosynthetics. Before entering durability, I want to give a, a perspective of what is service life? What do we expect? So to use, for that, I'm using uh, the example of a road. The, the design life for a, for a project is a duration which is completely arbitrarily set. It, is, it depends on the predicted evolution of the usage of the road acceptable time until the next major reconstruction for political, social reasons, uh, and of course, the expected durability of major components of the structure. Usually, design lives rarely exceed 100 to 120 years. So you can see on my photos here, the, a, a roadway can be designed for 2,000 years, but 2,000 years la later, chances are that the requirement for this road will no longer be the same. In the canal, the waterproofing materials so when we think of design life, uh, we think of service life of the material of the components. In the canal, the waterproofing product can be either exposed on the soil or on top of a concrete base, in which case the membrane is accessible and could theoretically be replaced periodically. So the durability, the, the service life we expect for this product can be adjusted according to the feature of this uh, lining product or it can be protected by a concrete cover or a geosynthetic system. Replacement, in that case, replacement of the membrane would require to rebuild completely the structure. So hence the reasonable question from the canal manufacturers, builders, managers, owners, uh, regarding the service life of the product. But we have to understand that the service life requirement is also depending on where the product is used on the structure. And this brings to the discussion on a more generic discussion on the suitability for purpose of a material used to control seepage. It, and so it has to be defined by the ability of the waterproofing material in the context of the, uh, to, to the ability of the product to be waterproof in the context of the application and to retain its water titles over time. So let's review for the exercise different products steel, wood, concrete, and geomembranes. So this product could be and have been in some cases used uh, for canal linings. First, steel. Is steel a suitable material for canal lining? Steel is waterproof, is used to contain liquids in several applications of different scales. 
still <laughs> can be treated to last in humid environments. Not a problem. Many ships are built with steel. It can be welded to create large and continuous surfaces. But covering large surfaces would be very expensive. And the cost component of, the, of this makes steel not appropriate. I would like to highlight uh, that uh, using steel, and let's call it reclaimed steel, has been tried uh, for, in canals for, can, for bank stabilization back in the 60s. So that is a funny picture, of course. That's not something to do, uh, and it did not last very long. But still, no wood. Wood uh, is wood suitable, uh, a suitable material for canal lining. So wood is waterproof. We make boats. Very nice boats are made with wood. And some of them last thousands of years. Wood, is, wood has also been used at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. It was used to make pipes and sewers. Different type of wood offer different resistance to water. We discovered recently a, a, a boat in Mexico, which was a few thousand years old. A, a trace, a, a boat which was used by Mayas back a couple thousand years ago. Wood was also used for canal, for bank uh, stabilization uh, in the Middle Age. So it was just a very common material back then. But at the end, wood is not a suitable material for canal lining because it would re just require too many assemblies. It's just too complex. It's not a good material for canal lining for many other reasons. No concrete. So I think you see where I'm coming there. Concrete is widely used for canal lining. But is it a good product to prevent seepage? For concrete to preserve its water tightness, it must not crack. Therefore, the concrete layer must be designed to resist, to resist reasonable soil settlements. It must be thick and reinforced. A thin layer of concrete will crack and will not preserve its water tightness. So we just saw in JP Giroux's presentation uh, several discussions on this aspect, and I don't need to go through that again. Also, concrete must not degrade over time. The formulation must be selected to resist permanent exposition to water. At the end, I think JP's made that very clear. Concrete is probably not the best material to control seepage in Canada. It can provide water proofing with geocells or things like that, but inherently, concrete is not a waterproofing product. Now let's go to geomembranes. Is geomembrane a material which is suitable for canal lining? So polymeric products, uh, plastics, are widely used to contain liquids. For example, plastic bottles. I have a plastic bottle here. I'm drinking from a plastic bottle. PVC, HDP, LLDP, and other geomembranes are watertight, can be assembled, are tolerant to small soil settlements, and are formulated to preserve their properties for very long duration. I would like to point out as well that uh, when we want to make concrete durable in a, in a humid environment to convey liquids, to convey chemicals, we put plastic on it because plastic, PVC, HDP, uh, or LLDP liners are going to improve the long-term resistance of concrete structures. But the geomembrane must offer a sufficient of its life. Too thin or badly formulated plastic films used in place of German braids will not offer a sufficient solid life. There were several experiences, and there are still today's experiences with LDP, for example, uh, which is a grade of polyethylene, which is very prone to stress cracking and is just not the right type of product. Uh, people are using this because they are a bit cheaper uh, instead of proper geomembranes. membranes and the film eventually cracks, and then uh, they have a bad experience with this product. So there are still products which are not qualified to be used as a GM membrane and are sold for these applications, which is a problem. So that's why we need to have a, a, a clear approach to the durability of uh, and the service life of uh, geosynthetics for use in canals. So in summary, steel and wood are obviously not suitable for canal lining despite they are waterproof and despite uh, they are used to contain liquids in other applications. Concrete is likely to crack and therefore is not suitable as a waterproofing material, unless it is a very strong, very thick layer. And, uh, but this said, it can, also, it can still offer protection for underlying geomembranes. membranes. Geomembranes membranes are suitable for using canal lining if their service life exceeds the design life of the structure. 
So we have different types of geomembrane, HDP, LLDP, PVC, EPDM, et cetera. So do they meet the requirements performance? So some of them were highlighted, most of them were highlighted by JP. So they are waterproof, they can be welded, they can be transported and installed, they are available and relatively cheap. It's easy to repair for most of them. They can resist small elongations, et cetera, et cetera. How long do they last? Service life can be estimated based on field observation, uh, looking at the performance of existing similar structures, or based on available science on the aging of polymers. If we look at the field experience with geosynetics, we can see that uh, they can last for more than 50 years. So in this table taken from a paper by Squero in, from 2005, we have two a, a series of uh, products that were used in dams, not canals, dams. And the oldest, uh, we have the age of the oldest exposed product. So here we see that for the covered German brain, the oldest one is from 1959. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a lot, that's uh, 62 years now uh, in Italy. And we have others following in 1960, 1970. For exposed germ brains, we have 1973, 1974, 1982. So we have quite a good experience of a good field experience demonstrating that germ brains can perform for more than 50 years. Again, I want to highlight the importance of service conditions. We have for bituminous lining system or bituminous uh, used as a sealing product. We have experiences which are thousands of years old. Uh, the Pont du Gard in France is still standing and uh, it's no longer conveying water, but it has been for about six centuries, uh, according to the historical records I've seen, without any maintenance. The reason why it's not conveying water, it's because there was no maintenance. Uh, so uh, this said, it's not any bituminous lining application will not work for 600 years. If you look at a roofing product, after 30 years, uh, it starts to, to, to degrade. So you have the very important influence of the service conditions to consider for to evaluate the durability of the product. Uh, another aspect which is very important is the stress that can be encountered during service, uh, during uh, when the material is exposed. It can be here we have cows who decided to take a walk in the canals despite the complete lack of grass or any interesting uh, things. So it's always better to cover a germ membrane to increase its service life as explained before or to minimize its exposure to accidental damage. <coughs> Sorry. So to, to cover the germ membrane to protect it from, these, uh, from the environment and from accidental damage, there are several solutions. A critical component of the design of a canal is indeed to select an adequate solution considering availability of materials, workmanship, subgrade, uh, properties of the soil, the cost, etc., etc. I took this photo, by the way, on the web page, on the Facebook page of the Ministry of Water Resource and Irrigation of Egypt. So you can see here a geomembrane, which is installed on the soil, and then you have a soil cover, and everything has been prepared to lay concrete. A geotextile could have been used here as well but they elected to use this design, which is an interesting approach. So in summary, uh, previous experience with the use of German brains in hydraulic applications has shown us that the oldest German brain is more than 60 years old and is still performing. Several uh, service life depends on service conditions. Protected geosynthetics last much longer than exposed geosynthetics. Now let's look at the service life of a German brain. How do we quantify this? How do we, make, how do we uh, assess this? Service life, uh, the criteria to be considered to declare the end of life of a German brain is when it leaks. Uh, this can be reached during construction when the service conditions are beyond what the material can handle. So that's an improper design, in which case the performance would be an issue. And uh, it can, uh, be reached when the material has lost its intrinsic properties and cracks under normal service condition. So survivability addresses mostly uh, delivery, unrolling, assembly into a continuous layer, covering with subsequent materials. 
performance is uh, related to the puncture by aggregate expansion reaction of the membrane while exposed to expansion and contraction of the joints of the concrete cover, slope stability, et cetera, et cetera. And the durability, uh, when we look at the, the, the condition that can lead to the, uh, reaching the end of life, it's about the resistance of the material with the potable water, if it is the case, with the contact to oxygen, uh, with, as we will see later. Uh, just to mention in, for the durability, canal lining is probably one of the least demanding application in terms of durability for German braids. Uh, these products are used in the mining industry where very long uh, durabilities are requested. Uh, they are used in waste containment uh, facilities, etc. So uh, if we look if we look at that, we can see that at the end, solvability address installation, performance address the service life of the, of the geomembrane, and durability focuses on the long-term performance. So if we look at the solvability first, this is again really based on field experience. The ability of the geomembrane to survive involves a holistic approach to the construction process. It includes how it, how it is stored and handled on site, uh, construction and installation techniques, mechanical properties of the gym membrane, use of cushioning materials such as, such as geotextiles, the overall design of the structure, and also the quality assurance. Uh, it's really important to have an adequate quality assurance. It's not something, uh, it, these products are, are sensitive, they must be properly handled, installed, and controlled. Electrical, electrical dislocation is a technique that could be uh, developed by itself. Uh, in a webinar by itself, and it is available in webinars to focus on quality assurance. Example of improper storage and handling. I've seen that on a project, the, the tracker had basically dumped everything out of the, of the platform. This is exactly what must not be done. You can see this roll, which is highly deformed. Uh, obviously, it was elongated locally. It has been possibly torn. It is the worst thing that can be done uh, for a geosanitic product. In the case of canal linings, uh, experience has taught us that a minimum thickness of one millimeter uh, is necessary. Any product less than one millimeter is, would be extremely demanding in terms of installation, of care for installation. So the saving you would make on the product would probably uh, lead to additional problem during uh, construction. Uh, and probably conflicts and stuff like that. So minimum, minimum thickness of one millimeter is essential. And this could have to be increased to 1.5 millimeters under warm climates. The thicker the product uh, up to some limit, the easier of, uh, the better, the easier it is to weld. Uh, minimizing the development of wrinkles caused by thermal expansion also reduces significantly the risk of accidental puncture. So uh, using a wide surface geomembrane will definitely reduce uh, wrinkling. And you can see on this photo, a very large surface with not that much wrinkles. It's, uh, it's very minimum, it's easy to handle. Uh, pouring, that's a, a pond obviously, it's not a canal. Uh, uh, it's a reservoir actually. Uh, but uh, pouring concrete or installing a material on top of this is not likely to create so much damage. So uh, the last thing is installers. Uh, survivability is connected to construction practice. So obviously it requires to have uh, experienced installers doing the construction. Now, if we go through performance, I will go very quickly on this uh, because it's not the main topic. JP has uh, presented some of these things. One thing I want to say is that all geomembranes are not the same. If you design a product uh, project uh, for a PVC geomembrane, which has a certain level of elongation, it's probably best to stick to that product when you go to the bidding stage and uh, purchase eventually the actual product. Uh, products are not going to perform the same. Uh, there are several considerations in design which I'm not going to go through here today. So you can, uh, JP presented this information as well. Uh, there has been since the mid nineties, it's really not uh, innovative anymore. It's really uh, well 
understood the design of canals with uh, of waterproofing uh, structure with geosynthetics. So back in 1995, Geosynthetic International published uh, the first special issue on the design of geomembrane applications. And in 97, another special issue on liquid migration control using geosynthetic liner systems. By the way, I want to point out that the full text of these papers are available to any member, any regular member of the IGS. So for a very nominal cost, which is in the 70 or $80 or maybe less, uh, you can become a member of the IGS and have full access to these papers. Finally, and to, there is a durability. We want the material to preserve its property over its entire service life. So how do we approach this? Uh, we have field experience, but we also need to have uh, scientific evidence and be able to project a durability for a product to connect it to a specification, et cetera. So there is a, so poly, polyethylene was well, polymers were developed uh, at the turn of the 20th century and became most of them became uh, produced industrially back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, there's been a lot of literature published. There are ASTM standards and test methods, design methods developed for these products in ASTM, in ISO, in SEN, and other platforms as well. Uh, Bob Kerner uh, uh, published six editions of a book which is Designing with Geosynthetics, which is very broadly used available for something like $5 on the web. It's a must have for anybody interested in geosynthetics. Uh, John Shears has published a very uh, informative book on polymeric gym membranes in particular. And I'm gonna use a lot today, the GRI, GRI white paper number six from GSI, also available for free on the web. So the lifetime can be predicted based on degradation mechanism of the gym membrane, which depend on the temperature, the chemical environment, exposition to UV, stress in some cases, etc. A typical end of life considered is a reduction of 50% of a relevant property, such as the elongation at break for a product uh, which function is to remain waterproof. Degradation mechanisms are product specific. So a PVC geomembrane will not be sensitive to the same uh, to the same uh, environmental factors than uh, HDP or not to the same level at least. Oxidation remains something which is common to all the geosynthetic products. It can be either UV or thermal, so a protected product will not suffer from any UV stress and a protected uh, and, and exposed product will have both UV and thermal exposure. In the case of polyethylene, so it's really the it's a it's a material which is which represents 36 percent of the total sales of plastics around the world. It's the most widely spread uh, polymer in the world. So there is really an abundant literature available on the aging of uh, polyethylene and in in particular uh, for human brains. Uh, these products have been also prescribed, uh, they are part of specification of regulations uh, for waste containment facilities in several countries. So for polyethylene, we are focusing really on oxidation at this point. Stress cracking is also a problem for HDP only, not for LLDP. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, so polyethylene membranes are formulated to resist oxidation and the rate of oxidation depends on the temperature. So the lifetime prediction on a product depends on the application and the location on Earth. Some regions like Egypt actually uh, are uh, warmer than others. A product uh, installed in Northern Europe uh, will experience a different temperature than a product installed in the Sahara, uh, for example. The oxidation process, without going into much details, the oxidation process uh, of the membrane is not a linear process. You can see here the antioxidant depletion time. So the antioxidants are added into the formulation of polyethylene to reduce the to reduce aging the aging rate. So during all the time where antioxidants are effective, 
property cha are not changing. So the geomembrane maintains 100% of its uh, tensile stress, tensile strength and tensile elongation until the antioxidants are completely depleted. Then there is an induction period and then properties start to reduce at a quicker pace. So uh, we need to understand that and uh, monitoring the aging of a polyethylene geomembrane is not based on mechanical properties. And so for a typical HDP geomembrane, and by typical, I mean uh, what was covered by uh, the GRI GM6 study. Uh, no, the G GRI six, uh, white paper number six uh, study. Uh, it's a product which is conforming to the GRI GM13 specification. So it's not LDP, which is sold as thin films as a replacement of germ brain in some uh, regions. It's strictly GRI GM13 compliant uh, germ membranes. Lifetime prediction, which are published in this paper, range from at 20 degrees Celsius, 446 years, and at a higher temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, 69 years. So we can see that it's very long. So now we have to, to think how will that, uh, to, to assess what would be the a reasonable service life prediction for a German brain, we need to know the temperature of the soil. So we've looked at the soil temperature in Egypt to focus on Egypt. And uh, we found some information that we are saying that basically the maximum temperature which can be experienced in the region of Almenia is 24 degrees Celsius uh, in, uh, in summer. With that, we can use this prediction and see that at 30 degrees Celsius, the prediction of uh, the, the total service life of a polyethylene HDP geomembrane is can be considered to exceed 166 years. So with this observation in mind, uh, we, I think it's better to state that a lifetime of a HDP German brain can be considered as being significantly greater than the typical design life of 100 years for uh, any construction structure. So in short, the German brain will survive the, any other component of a canal. Uh, another important aspect to, to highlight is that during approximately two thirds of the predicted service uh, lifetime, the mechanical properties of the German brain will not change. So again, this applies to products conforming to the GRI GM13 specification. Uh, no, there is other products. It's not only HDP. We have also LLDPE, uh, for example, which is another product of uh, very high interest for these applications because it is not sensitive to stress cracking, for example. So these products degrade faster than HDPE. The primary reason for that is that they are more permeable to oxygen and so the oxidation reaction can take place quicker. Uh, to achieve similar service life uh, than HDP with LDP, you have to use better stabilization package and thicker products. That's basically the, the conclusion. The rate of degradation of PVC depends on the type of plasticizers. There are very significant difference in performance between different grades of PVC joint rates. But in terms of service life, we know from experience that they can last for a uh, duration similar to what we see with HDP, what we project with uh, HDP. EPDM are very inert products. They contain up to 40% of carbon black, uh, anything between 20 and 40%. And th therefore, they are very stable. The oldest German brain in service is actually a predecessor of EPDM, uh, and it's 62 years and still alive. So for bituminous products, uh, these products really piggyback on the historical use of bitumen as a sealing product in covered application. Bitumen was the historical geomembrane in the world, spray-applied or liquid-applied geomembrane back when people did not even know there was membranes. Uh, I think we can date the early applications of bitumen to about 6,000 years. So uh, for exposed application now, uh, every type of geomembrane is sensitive to UV and weathering. An exposed geomembrane is subject to vandalism, accidental damage, wildlife. It is always better to protect the geomembrane. 
Nevertheless, the Geocentric Institute is conducting a very long-term assessment of the performance of human brain using laboratory exposure. So this is a project which has been starting in the early 2000s, and the data which are published in the white paper number six, uh, last revision is 10 years ago. Uh, the predicted, uh, the predicted uh, lifetime predictions are uh, as published here. So you can see here that some products are still under testing. Uh, you can see HDP with service life far in excess of uh, 36 years, EPDM, FPP, flexible polypropylene, and a formulation of PVC, which is better than the, the, the other. You see, by the way, here that one uh, PVC dual membrane has already reached its end of life after 18 years, while the other one goes up to 32 years. So overall, several products can survive in excess of 30 years, uh, and these products are supported with the performance of actual projects, by the way. It's, these predictions are consistent with monitored projects. So to conclude my presentation, uh, German brains are more suitable than concrete to act as a sitting material. I think that's, uh, that's a fact. In fact, German brains are the most suitable material for sealing canals. Uh, this said, German brains should be protected against accidental degradation, vandalism, exposition to UV, and excessive heat. Concrete, concrete slabs, or other protection materials such as geocentics can be used for that purpose. A protected German brain can offer a service life in excess of 100 years. To offer such a performance, the German brain must be adequately formulated. So, with adequately selected antioxidants, for all polymeric German brains with plasticizers for PVC, and the range, the grade of plasticizer is extremely important. And that concludes my presentation. So uh, I think now we would uh, go to the question and answer session. We are all here. Today, so I think we have a, a, a few questions. I think it's uh, very interesting. So uh, I'll take them uh, in their orders. There will be material to download regarding the workshop. Uh, people who will have attended uh, will be sent an email uh, and others as well uh, with a link to the recording of the presentations and. Uh, PowerPoint presentation, copy of the PowerPoint presentation for those that will be made available. There is a question for Dr. Giroux. I am wondering how to prevent stress tracking in German brains may be caused by the sustainable, sustained tensile strain applied to German brain because of differential settlements. So my understanding of the question is how to pre uh, how the elongation caused by the stress induced in a German brain because of a differential settlement can accelerate stress cracking of a German brain. Do, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, so what, what is exactly the question? Okay, I'm going to read it again. I am wondering how to prevent stress cracking in German brains that may be caused by the sustained tensile strain applied to the German brain because of differential settlements. Well, a differential settlement uh, causes elongation in the German brain. So uh, the first thing to do is to have a good design to minimize differential settlement, which is quite possible. You, usually we have a differential settlement between um, an earth structure and a compacted soil structure and a concrete structure. Um, and the geomembrane is attached to the concrete structure and there is differential settlement between the concrete structure and the soil, because the concrete, concrete structure doesn't move significantly 
whereas the soil uh, typically will settle. Uh, the first thing to do is to have a good design. For example, the shape of the concrete structure must be such that the soil is partly supported by the concrete structure. If you have a concrete structure with vertical walls, the soil can settle a lot against the vertical wall. If the wall has a slope, it just doesn't need to be very steep, just a slight batter. Uh, this will prevent very large soil movement next to the concrete structure. So th this is uh, an important uh, thing to do. Um, now, the large elongation that may, may be caused by um, differential settlement may cause a premature failure or may cause stress cracking in the long term. And uh, if uh, settlement has not been prevented by good design, then uh, the geomembrane has to withstand the, the elongation. Uh, and geomembranes are very different from this viewpoint. Uh, some are more extensible than others. Uh, so if in a certain case, it appears that differential settlement cannot be avoided, um, a, a geomembrane with a large elongation potential should be used. Now, cracking is typical of high density polyethylene. Other geomembranes do, do not exhibit stress cracking. Um, so, therefore, uh, if there is a possibility of large differential settlement, this may be a case where high-density polyethylene is not uh, recommended. Uh, in fact, high-density polyethylene has a relatively low elongation compared to other geomembranes and is more susceptible to stress cracking. So that would be my conclusion. So first, good design. And if it cannot be done for some reason, then select a geomembrane with a large extensibility and no susceptibility to stress cracking. I would like to add to that, that uh, tomorrow we have the second day of the, this series of three web webinars and we'll have people from the industry uh, who will present the properties of different products and the, their behavior uh, will be addressed uh, at that time as well. So for those who are here, please reconvene tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon in Egypt uh, for this, uh, for this, uh, for a specific discussion on German brain. So uh, another question uh, for waterproofing work associated with rigid concrete structure like dams, channels, tunnels, etc., which have sharp bends. Which type is preferable? PVC, HDP, polypropylene, or EPDM geomembrane? So I think the question is uh, that it's not addressed specific, specifically to anybody. So maybe Jean-Pierre, you have uh, an opinion on this? Well, the, this question is similar to the previous one. I mean, if, if uh, there are areas where the geomembranes is likely to be exposed to large elongation, then um, the type of geomembrane should be uh, such that it is a geomembrane that can resist large elongation. So the geomembrane that uh, could potentially pose problems are those with less ability to elongate, which are first all the geomembranes reinforced with a woven fabric. There is, for example, a reinforced polypropylene um, and a geomembranes with uh, low 
uh, elongation, low extensibility, uh, the one that has less extensibility than others is again high density polyethylene. So these are the two types of geomembranes that should be carefully evaluated depending on the magnitude of the expected deformation. Uh, other geomembranes are very large extensibility, uh, especially uh, PVC and EPVM, uh, when they are not reinforced with a woven uh, fabric. The PVC uh, associated with a non-woven uh, geotextile um, has large elongation and at the same time, um, a very linear stress-strain curve, which uh, uh, acts in favor of uh, good resistance to differential settlement. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I have to support your opinion and maybe add that uh, using a, a system made of a combination of geotextile cushioning products offering a slippery surface may also help distribute the elongation uh, in especially for applications like tunnels uh, where the stress level may not be uh, very high uh, may or may not uh, locally uh, and using cushioning and slippery surfaces may also help distribute and minimize the problems even for uh, more sensitive uh, products from products with less elongation Yes, th this is a good point. In my presentation, I mentioned the yeah. uh, function of uh, geotextile which I called uh, stress uh, relief interlayer or something like that. Uh, the geotextile providing a, a low friction surface that uh, helps distribute the stress and elongation in the geomembrane. So we have um, uh, we have uh, other questions. Some questions are about the availability of uh, presentation materials. So yes, uh, what can be made available will be made available, and the video recording will be made available, and we'll receive a notification on that. Uh, there are questions on the cost, uh, relative cost between geosynthetics and concrete, and this is, I think, something which would be very difficult to to to, to present in detail. It's a very market specific. Uh, right now, there is a, a, a shortage of some uh, of some polymers, which makes membranes more expensive than they have been one or two years ago. We don't know what the cost can be. It's a specific uh, thing. Uh, so many requests uh, regarding the the sharing the presentation material, and it will be available. Question. Uh, when are canals used as opposed to large pipes? So uh, maybe Dr. Ragab, uh, you would have an answer for that. Uh, this is really about the practice in uh, irrigation in agriculture. So when do we use canals and when are large pipes preferred uh, in the irrigation sector? Well, um, the, the pipes are... Uh, preferred option because they use less of the lands. So in terms of really increasing the land area uh, for food production, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that would be uh, the, the, the best solution is to, to use underground um, buried uh, pipe, pipeline uh, rather than to, to have open canals. The other thing is the evaporation losses from open uh, canals as well. And you have seen in some of the slides that uh, we started to cover them with um, solar panel to minimize the evaporation and also to produce some clean energy. So in, in the Middle East, I think uh, you, you see more open uh, canals and uh, some Asian countries as well. But if you come to Europe, actually it is more common not, to use, not common to see open canals, but it's more of pipelines. So if you go to um, Italy, which is one of the uh, 
also uh, uh, drier uh, countries than UK or since Scandinavian countries, they, they have uh, even introduced the, the, the uh, water pipes a long, long time ago uh, because they, they, they believe that uh, you will lose a lot of water by evaporation and also uh, you are using part of your land that can be really minimized by just uh, bury, burying the, uh, the, the pipeline. So I, I personally prefer um, the pipelines. Uh, in some uh, parts in Europe, they use it over the land. Uh, and in some other parts, it's uh, buried under the land. So uh, this is uh, uh, one way really of, uh, but of course, the issue sometimes comes is that detection of the leakage uh, mm -hmm. is, is an issue when you have pipelines that uh, you need to have uh, a smart way to detect what the leakage is. And even water companies here, like Thames Water and um, closer to London, they, they started to use really uh, GIS and remote sensing and images and so on to detect uh, the leakage and uh, to try to repair that. So everything comes really with, with issue with it. So there is nothing really uh, completely free of, um, of uh, problems, uh, but you have uh, you, you select a system and you have to know what actually, what are the problems that would be associated and what would be the solutions for that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, evaporation is the only difference between the two systems really, open or or of pipelines. So I think that uh, also introduce the, the question of evaporation, uh, introduce the next question, which is what is your experience with covering canals? So I think you have presented some information with the use of uh, solar panel system on top of canals, yeah. but maybe you have other experiences as well in a similar direction. Instead of having a, a pipeline, uh, having an open canal, but with a cover. Yeah. Yeah, one, one, one way is that we, um, we try to put uh, those solar panels uh, on top of those uh, canals. And uh, well, it's where I live here now, it's uh, farmers, they get together and they build a, 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 together a reservoir. And the, the environment agency here would allow them to take water during the high flows which means that when you really have enough flow in the rivers, they, the, the farmers, they get temporary license that they can abstract water during the high, high flows to their reservoirs. But of course, they, 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 sometimes you get years like 2018, we had a very dry year and temperature uh, soared really above 30 at some, some days. That evaporation of course will go uh, high as well. So the, the idea came with the solar panel is to reduce, especially during the drought period, the losses by evaporation because it, it could be substantial. At the same time, having those floating panels that also produces some uh, energy to uh, farms because those farms now, they are actually uh, not only producing uh, cereals, and, but also they have livestock they have dairy products. They produce now ice creams, butter, and so on. So they use that solar uh, energy uh, in uh, producing the the the, uh, the uh, whatever the 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 food productions that they are really uh, uh, keen on. And uh, and by this, they, they have really um, some other income from releasing some of the the energy to the, the network. So if they don't use all the energy, and, but of course it comes with design as well as uh, 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 troubles with, uh, with the solar panel because you have to leave enough spaces between the, 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 the different parts of the solar panel because of the fish community. They, they, you need to have uh, the light to, to go also through the panels and for, to maintain the, the, the fauna and algae and all those bio um, uh, diversity uh, to carry on without being really covered all the time and uh, to have a dark uh, riverbed. 
So th there is a design for it, and you have to take into account the, the biodiversity and the ecosystem really uh, that uh, should survive with, with the proper design. But uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's a good way to, to have uh, clean energy and also to minimize the evaporation, but at the same time, also the used lining here in, 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 uh, in, in those reservoirs. Uh, so did they have in mind that the water should, should stay, not to, to, to go uh, by, by seepage to the aquifer. So they, they do lining here and, uh, uh, and, and of course it's very important to have it right for, uh, for that. Thank you, uh, indeed. So there is no easy answer, surprisingly. <laughs> no. So uh, uh, the next question is, uh, do you consider the new reinforced polymer modified concrete uh, geocinetics? I think that is something that, um, if, if you're speaking of uh, GCCM, uh, that is something that's going to be presented uh, on Wednesday. On Wednesday, there is presentation specific for uh, GCCM with all the details. So maybe I, I would recommend that you attend the, the, the presentation on Wednesday. Um, there are some questions about the design of geocells. Same thing, on Wednesday we have a presentation dedicated to geocells and uh, maybe that's a good opportunity to, uh, to, to attend this presentation and to learn uh, specifically on geocells. Maybe JP, you have some uh, information on uh, other sources of, uh, of information for the design of geocells? Well, the, one of the issue is uh, stability on slopes and uh, uh, there are design methods which are very similar to the design of slope stability in geotechnical engineering plus the effect of uh, soil reinforcement. Me, I can add that there is uh, extensive work which is being carried uh, in ASTM D35 and uh, ISO TC221 for the design of geocell systems. Uh, it's focusing most on stabilization, on soil stabilization for road construction, but uh, the the in important uh, aspects are, uh, generic aspects are discussed there. Um, so another question is, is there a typical design proposition for German brain used in Nigeria, having in mind the poor CBR of the subgrade? Do we have a generic answer for this? So installation, of a uh, geomembrane for a canal application, I suppose, uh, with a poor CBR of the subgrade. Maybe we can, it's maybe too difficult to give a generic answer. It's a, maybe a project specific aspect which should be covered by the design engineer, I suppose. Well, we, we, we know how to uh, deal with the soil having a low CBR. Mm -hmm. for the construction of unpaved roads. And there are well-known design methods for that. So if the challenge is to construct a, a base, a firm base on which a geomembrane liner can be installed uh, in case of the soil having a very low CBR ratio, uh, we could use some of the uh, some of the findings, some of those uh, methods for unpaved roads to prepare a, a strong subgrade able to uh, be lined with the geomembrane. So that, this is the way I would proceed. Mm -hmm. So uh, treat separately the lining from the stabilization of the subgrade with it's a different set of geocentics. Yes, first stabilize the subgrade. Exactly. You know how to do that. And, and then design Proceed. or lining. Yeah, because depending on the height of water in the canal, the, the load can be substantial. I think I understand the, the magnitude of the question. 
Well, the, the problem may happen mostly during construction because the, the problem with low CBR soil is uh, the rutting into that soil, the punching of the soil. So the, the uniform pressure of water in service would not be a problem. The problem would be to achieve the construction, the, the load uh, applied to the uh, low bearing capacity soil with construction equipment, et cetera. And essentially, okay. we have to build a, a kind of an unpaved road at the base of the canal, mostly for the loading during construction. But the good news is that geoscientics indeed offer sustainable, very sustainable solution compared to traditional techniques. So using geocell or geogrids can be can offer a very strong platform uh, at a relatively at a very low cost at the end, compared to bringing in more soil, gravel, or whatever. Yes, we have developed methods for uh, road construction with geogrids and with geocell. Yeah, yeah. The Giroud Han method, <laughs> another uh, heritage of JP. So another question for Dr. Giroud, uh, how to install GCL underwater? Uh, is it a special GCL, uh, which is for this application? Um, I don't think it needs to be a special GCL, but um, the problem is the ballasting during the the installation, so um, a combination of GCL loaded with, uh, uh, with sand, um, a combination of sand geocomposite and GCL could be the uh, right way to, to go. Uh, unfortunately, we, in the next two days, we do not have a presentation of installation of bentonite geocomposite. So, and maybe Natalie Tooz has uh, experience. She has experience with uh, uh, bentonite geocomposites for lining. I, I don't have experience myself, but we can send some references to the people interested uh, there. So I will I will send you some references, Eric, that you can forward. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we have other activities coming up. Uh, one of them is in uh, Adelaide in Australia with the ICID uh, conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will incorporate, this is indeed, uh, this was indeed omitted. Uh, the GCL should have been in this series of webinars. Um, so the next question is, what are the cost implications of incorporating germ brain in new concrete lined canals? Uh, I think the cost implications are a bit difficult to address. It's really project specific. Uh, is, there is no generic answer. Uh, using a type of product will have different requirements on the concrete than another type and so on. So I think I prefer to leave this, uh, this uh, aside for, for now. Uh, next question, uh, it's a comment as well as a, a remark. Uh, thank you everyone for all your very interesting presentation. It seems to me that an important challenge of geocentrics in the canals remains the stability of the product on the slopes of the banks of the canal, often very steep, sometimes one-to-one. -one. This can be a problem for blankets. Another challenge for uncovered German brain is also the possibility of making anchors in the embankments. Well, uh, stability of uh, geomembranes on slope is not a problem because uh, generally they are anchored at the top and the anchorage is sufficient to ensure the stability. Uh, also, uh, as I said, in many cases, the geomembrane is covered with something which should be concrete or one of the geosynthetic systems I have presented. In those cases, the stability problem is not for the geomembrane, but for the cover of materials. Um, indeed, the slopes are, are steep. The most typical slope is 1.5 to 1, which, which is steep. 
but um, it is a classical activity for geotechnical engineers to uh, determine what to do to ensure slope stability. So it's not a, a special problem, uh, a problem with, with solution. I realize that we are significantly behind uh, the, <laughs> the time limit set initially. Uh, if uh, you are okay, I would like to, uh, I have picked one question which I think is, in, is very important to address and uh, we are going to close after this question. And I would like, uh, I think JP, you would be the first person for this one. So it's from Lee Church. How would you relieve hydrostatic pressure in the channel? Are non-return valve at risk of situation preventing effective operation? Could drainage geocomposite be incorporated? I think that is about the hydrostatic pressure prevailing under the liner, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is a very important aspect to, to, to address. Yes, the, this is a, a typical discussion. Um, a solution that's often mentioned is to use um, some types of valve or, or flaps that open under pressure when the canal is empty, uh, water from underneath could e escape through a, a flap that would open by itself under the water pressure. The problem is those system um, usually do not work in the long term because they become blocked by uh, silt deposit at the bottom of the canal. So the only real good long-term solution is to install a drainage under a canal. Um, I wanted to discuss that during my presentation, but it was already too long. And um, we have the same problem in reservoirs. I showed a photo of uh, geomembrane liner uplifted by gas in a reservoir in a very spectacular manner. But we have many examples of more discrete uplift by water under geomembranes in reservoirs. And the only solution is drainage. Um, so drainage, uh, can be done by traditional means, but more and more often it is done using uh, geosynthetics, uh, either with uh, drainage uh, uh, trenches, I mean, localize the drainage from place to place, or if <clears throat> the problem is uh, more serious, uh, drainage uh, over the entire surface of the geomembrane. So there will be a drainage uh, geosynthetic under the geomembrane. Now, in all cases, the problem is how to evacuate the water uh, if the canal, uh, as usual, is excavated in the ground, then the water cannot be removed by gravity. Uh, except that it can flow in the same direction of the canal and be collected from place to place. The, the big problem is not so much the drainage, but how to evacuate the, the drain, the water. But this is very classical in all landfills. We have drainage in many reservoirs. We have drainage under the geomembrane. So uh, there is, uh, uh, a practice of doing that and a practice of designing for that. Thank you. We have at least between five and 10 other questions, but I think it's, uh, we're already half an hour behind the time limit we had set. So uh, I, I think it's time to thank everybody for being there. The, we will do our best to answer the questions uh, as much as possible. Uh, and uh, provide these answers to, uh, to the group who asked the questions. But unfortunately, we have to stop now. So I would really like to thank uh, the 
the, the, the panelists, the, the speakers for their contribution, uh, Dr. Giroud, Dr. Tooze, Dr. Ragab. Uh, and it was a very instructive, very, very good presentation. And of course, His Excellency, who is no longer with us, he had to leave for other duties. But of course, uh, I have to thank His Excellency for also introducing to us the situation in Egypt, which is which is uh, very special and uh, and so important for the country, and that reflects a situation that will be global in the years to come. Water management, water preservation. Egypt is leading the way, but other countries will face the same problems. So we have we're we're happy to contribute to the resolution of problems in Egypt, and hopefully that will help uh, others as well to to progress uh, in the future. So thank you very much. With that. Uh, expect to receive from us the uh, a link to be able to to read uh, the presentation and to view the video the recording video of the webinar and with that we will end the webinar thank you eric for your excellent organization thank you very much eric. thank you thank you thank you